started in May. And uh, turn in your Bibles to look at Deuteronomy, chapter 30. <laughs> Thou mayest love the Lord thy God 
and that thou mayest obey his voice, uh, and thou shalt mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, your life and how long you live, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord spared unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. <coughs> now while a great deal of that deals with the nation of Israel and them representatives of God and the land of Israel being the promise that God was going to give it to them and enlarge them in it. We can take that and understand it in that context. But do not remove yourself from the blessing and cursing and the choosing of life. You've got the choice for good or evil, a death for life. All these things are choices that we still make today and that we're going to be judged for and held accountable to. And so God has given us the same promises other than the land that goes with it and the blessings that come with obedience to the Lord. Well, now here's what I want you to hear this morning. I don't remember the first time that I heard this song, but as the song went on, I thought, well, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty. And then it had an ugly side to that song. And yet it was a very true side. A uh, number of years ago, we started down as a nation a very slippery slope. And you know, once you start down and it's very steep, it's hard to recover. Uh, so uh, I practice this song. I can't sing it without crying. And so uh, you listen to the message.
Father, we bow our heads and thank you this morning for the name and love and thank you, God, for the many blessings you bestowed upon us. How good you are to us, Lord, to be able to have our families and our loved ones, Lord, and be able to have time to share with them and to have time that we can spend with them in years and birthdays and special occasions and all the things, Lord, that make family special. And I praise you and I thank you, God, for being there for us when no one else can be, Lord. Father, for watching over our homes and our families and giving us such an amazing grace. And I pray, Lord, for each one that they might know Jesus Christ in the full pardon of sin and realize how great and how precious uh, you are to us and that you've chosen life for us. Eternal life, God, Father, I pray in heaven as well as, Father, the blessings of this life and the good things that come from knowing you. I pray that you'll guide and direct the service today. I pardon it, Lord. You might be magnified. I pray your hand upon us. I touch our heart and our life. Lord, we're going to love you for it. In Christ our Savior's precious name. And amen. As I look around in the church today and I see everybody and I don't have any doubt about it. We all love children. We love our families and enjoy the time that we get to share with one another. Uh, those are precious times that God has given to us. And I'm reminded so many different times when I read the Bible and uh, how that Jesus uh, would uh, allow the little children to come to Him. And disciples not understand it. They try to uh, forbid the little ones from coming to Him. And He said, forbid them not. And uh, so He took them up in His arms. He blessed them. And so uh, I believe children, uh, families, uh, men and women, uh, they all mean a great deal to God. They mean a great deal to Jesus. You think about it, He died for each and every one of them. Amen? The last part of the song that uh, was made famous by uh, Brian Freed Assurance uh, talks about how that God is picking up the pieces, amen, and uh, putting back together those little precious lumps of clay. And it just shows in that song how much that maybe we don't think about life and the way that we've gone, but how much I believe that God thinks about life and cares about these children. And I've read, read a number of things in preparation uh, for the service today. I want to go back in our scripture text this morning. Uh, there were a number of times where God would speak to the parents and how that He was going to bless them and encourage them and how that He was going to open up and uh, multiply them in the land. Uh, their cattle was going to increase, that their crops would increase, their possessions would increase, but also their seed, their, their body would, would increase, their, their babies, amen, their children. Uh, that God would give them would be increased. And so all these things are looked at by God, by what? As blessings, amen? And then the Bible tells us that children are a, a blessing, they're a gift from God. And so uh, today, to finish off my sermon uh, titled the theme on uh, marriage and the family, I want to cover a little bit about abortion today. And I know uh, that maybe it doesn't apply to everybody here, uh, but by Facebook and YouTube and however else, uh, that the Word of God is able to get out. And someone, uh, Gary mentioned during Sunday school class about preachers that's bold enough uh, to talk about heaven, talk about hell, and talk about needing to be saved and all of these things. I thought about when he mentioned that, said a lot of uh, churches aren't going to preach on abortion either. Uh, they're not going to mention it because they don't want, as he mentioned, uh, to run anybody off. You know, if you tell me I'm, I'm bad and I'm evil and I need to be saved, I'll just go to another church. I don't have to hear that. Or if I want my body to tell me what I want to have of it, then abortion's all right for me, uh, then I'll just go ahead and do it. And I won't need that. I'll just go to another church. And I've always believed this morning that if you don't like what's going on here, you can go down the road. If you go down the road, you don't like what they've got, you can go a little further. Eventually, you're going to find some church somewhere that's going to say, yeah, we don't agree with that either. You're welcome here. Amen. I mean, there are churches that will just about do anything. When you see the word C-H-U-R-C-H on a church, you kind of identify that with Christianity, right? Whether it's Catholic, Episcopalian, Baptist, Lutheran, whatever that it is, you kind of identify that with Jesus Christ, with Christianity. And so there are a lot of things that have the church logo name on it, but have nothing to do with God. And so I, I'm bold enough this morning to say regardless whether it's appreciated, whether regardless whether it's liked or not, I believe God chooses life. I believe that God's against abortion. Uh, uh, think about the things that our country uh, stands for or should stand for. And our government has an obligation to protect its most innocent and vulnerable members of that government. Amen that society. And what are they? They are the old, the very age, 
we should watch out for, protect them, and do what we can. And then the very young, amen, and you can't get any younger than still being in the womb, amen. At that point, you have a Midas birthday. You're still a person. You're still alive. You're not a fetus. You're a baby. You're a human being, even at that time. But our government should protect that baby. Back in 1973, uh, with Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court uh, went ahead and lawfully made it all right for a person that has made a mistake, uh, got in trouble, had an accident, it's inconvenient, I don't want to be bothered uh, to have an abortion. Whatever the reason was uh, that you might come up with, uh, that it was all right to have an abortion. And then the government funds certain places like Planned Parenthood and different clinics in the United States that if you want to not have a baby, then it's possible for you to also not have to pay anything to not want that baby, not have that baby. And there's a poll that I read up north somewhere about uh, um, uh, 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 people where if they knew that uh, couples, if they knew ahead of time uh, being pregnant, if they knew ahead of time that their baby was going to be a number of things, uh, would they choose abortion instead of allowing that to come on? And I picked a few of the things out with it. One of the things said, if you knew ahead of time that your child, when it got older, was going to develop Alzheimer's, would you choose abortion and not have that baby? And a number of them said, yeah, I don't want my, my children uh, later on to have Alzheimer's. That's troubling. It is troubling. It's a horrible disease. Amen? And so that's the solution they came up with. But another one said, well, now what if your child you knew when he got older, uh, not real old, but older, uh, was going to be obese? It's going to be way heavier than what it ought to be. If your child was going to be obese, would you choose abortion? And they said, yeah, we choose abortion because that's unhealthy. It's a horrible life to live, and they can't live like that. So we choose abortion uh, for obesity. And then the, the number one that I picked out that's kind of special to me uh, that I think about is when if you knew that your child was going to be a boy and you wanted a girl, or if you wanted a girl and you were a boy and you wanted a, a boy and it was going to be a girl, would you choose abortion just because of the sex that it was going to be? And they said, yeah, well, I don't want a boy, I want a girl, I want a girl, I don't want a boy, amen, whatever it might be. And yeah, I choose abortion because that's not the one I want. And I think about how frivolous we are in the United States of America and how little we value life. Uh, today, we have devalued life to the point that there are certain groups that hear more about the snail darters, don't know if anybody remembers that, about the owls out there, about different animals that get caught in uh, ice uh, uh, circles, they can't get out, the ocean's real far away, and there are people that would uh, go out and they would fight that and they do everything they could to keep them the whales and put the sharks back in the water and protect the little snail daughter lizard and all of these things, but when it comes down to human life, we are so frivolous to the point uh, that we even had the Supreme Court come up and make the decision, yeah, if you don't want a baby, whether it's a boy or a girl, or if it's going to be old and have Alzheimer's, or it's going to be heavy and be obese, if you don't want that child, or for any reason at all, if you don't want to be troubled or bothered by a baby, you have the right because it's your body uh, to go ahead and kill that fetus because it really is just a lump of matter anyway and it doesn't really matter. That's the kind of a mindset uh, that they've got. Let's go back to a few verses of scripture that I read. Uh, in the United States since 1973, we have aborted about 59 million babies in America. 59 million of babies in America since that time. And it's hard to recover once you start down that slope. Uh, the government says we need to do this for a little while and once we get over this little hump, we'll straighten things out. So I think about the mindset uh, that it has. Once something becomes law, it's awfully hard to withdraw that law again. Now they're fighting it now. They've been fighting it since that day. Will it ever happen? I have absolutely no clue. I also don't have much hope. Uh, for America. Amen. Uh, the song in the last part of it, I said, can somebody tell me 
what has happened to America. Uh, well, what happened to Israel is exactly what happened to America. Let's read a little bit of it. Remember, Deuteronomy is telling them uh, that there's a life and a death blessing and cursing that goes with the choices you make in life. The lifestyle that you live, uh, the choices that you have, and I've said this before, you're free to make whatever choice you want for life. But you're not free to choose the consequences of that life. God has set certain things in order, and if you go beyond the boundaries of that order, it's going to come back on you, and you're not going to appreciate it. Let me go like I say it like this: If you put your hand into a flame, it's going to hurt. You can make the choice to go ahead and put your hand in the flame, and you can say it's not going to hurt. But God has already determined that if you put your hand in the flame, it's going to do what? It's going to hurt. So you can make any choice. You want to, but the consequences of that choice aren't going away. What God said in order is going to happen. But look back at what's being said here in the Word of God. Uh, verse 9. And the Lord thy God will make you plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit, babies of thy body, the fruit of thy cattle, your young ones, are going, your cattle are going to have young ones, in the fruit of thy land, the possessions, and the, the crops, for good. God's doing this. You follow me. You obey me. You choose life and live. And it's going to be a blessing to you. And I'll give you the blessings that go with it. And for the Lord will uh, again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are laws and are written in this book of the law, if thou wilt turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. Then he said, For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you need to go up or say come down with it or other place. It mentions in the book of Acts, neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say who shall go to the sea for us that it be brought in us that we may hear and do it. But the word is very near to thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have said before thee this day life and good and death and evil and I... And that I command thee this day to love the Lord God, to walk in His way, and His statutes, commandments, His statutes, His commandments, and His judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But here it is. Verse 17. But if thine heart turn away from doing what? Following God, obeying His commandments, doing His judgments, following His statutes, but thou shalt be drawn away and worship other gods. Or another uh, uh, way of saying it. And begin to worship false gods. Idol gods. Things that are not. And serve them. Then God said, I denounce unto you. I publish to you. I make it plain to you. That ye shall surely perish. And that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land. Whither thou goest over Jordan to possess it. Then God said to Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that thou, that both thou and thy seed may live. Here it is. What did Israel do? Whenever that God uh, by Moses told them uh, that he was going to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey and that they need to hear this and God uh, told them and said if you do this you're going to receive the judgment that come from that blessing uh, from that covenant relationship that we've got and the people all said God forbid that we should do that. In other words we're not going to go against God when we come into the promised land and exactly what God told them not to do and that Moses told them that they might I do when they got into the promised land they forgot about God they forgot about his commandments they forgot about his statutes they forgot about his judgment they forgot about his cursing but they did not forget about the blessing and whenever they got over there and forgot God God got the curse upon them and they hollered out to God and said why have you dealt with us so that's where America is at today America was a Christian nation. America was a nation that was established on Christian principle, upon Christian basics, 
upon the Word of God. America was a nation that separated from England because they wanted to be able to worship God without having someone else tell them how to do it. And so they left England, they came to America, and they established our country. And my friend, the laws that we have uh, that were established back in, in the Constitution are based on the biblical principles of the Judeo-Christian ethics. Now I know that they've got a reformation going to remove any mention of God and the Bible out of our history. But they're not going to be able, because of the publishing of all the books they've got, to ever remove them all. And so they're rewriting these things in our classrooms and in our country. And they're taking out anything that has to do with God and Jesus Christ. And they're having to take out anything that has Scripture attached to it. Although a number of our early and possibly every one of our presidents had at least a number of things that they said about God that they said about Jesus Christ, that they said about the Bible, amen, and the signers of the Constitution also in that same way. So as they try to take apart the framework stick by stick of our Constitution and of our history, they're going to do their best to reform it, but they're not going to be able to get rid of it. But because they're wanting to, we're going to get back to what we mentioned in Israel uh, because they forgot God God brought the curses upon them. You look around at the laws of the land today and what our country allows and what our country is symbolically standing on and for and those things that are against the Word of God, that are against God, that are against Jesus Christ. Amen. For those things, America is headed down a slippery slope and we're headed for destruction. I don't see the book of uh, the Bible anywhere that talk about the United States in the end time. I believe that a reason to have that is because of the lack of morals and righteous ethics that's in our country today. We're getting right for the judgment of God upon America. Whenever the, uh, we have uh, all this homosexuality are going on and our country has passed laws uh, for same-sex marriage and for transgenderism and all of these things today that has become the norm. Amen. We mentioned this a while ago uh, that what you accept today becomes the norm tomorrow. Amen. And so these things we've accepted today and didn't speak out about them and they become normal. I think a lot about Madeline Muriel Hare uh, whenever that she first said that we don't need to be praying in school. That's bringing the God into the classroom. And she went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed with her that yeah, you can't mention God in the schools no more. Get rid of prayer in the schools today. Amen. And so we seem like that that for me in my lifetime really brought it to the head to the front of where we are as a nation morally. Our churches ought to have stood up. We ought to have rebelled. We ought to have held sit -ins. We ought to have done something to let our uh, government our Supreme Court justices know that we disagree with taking prayer out of school. But because we didn't as, a, as churches as a nation of Christians and churches, because we did it, that got passed. And back when it started, it's still today. You can't pray. You can't pray at a ball game. You can't pray at a sporting event of any kind. You can't have uh, Christmas carols. Uh, you can't have Bible study. You can't have prayer. You can't have this. If it has anything to do with God and Jesus Christ, it's against the law, according to the way that a number of them think. But I tell you what, you can worship your witches. You can have your witch classes in it. Uh, the United States military has made it so that if you want to worship Allah or if you want to worship the devil, if you want to be a witch, they will allow it. They've got chaplains in the military they've had for many, many years uh, where the, the Christian church and the Jewish guys can have a rabbi, uh, but now they allow Wiccans, uh, they allow Muslims. All these guys are, are chaplains in our military. Uh, am I against any religion? I'm against false religion. Amen. I'm not against the people, but we need to stand up and let them know there are some things that are just wrong. And those things are just wrong. That's why America is headed in the direction that it's headed. 
And, and the only solution and the only thing that's going to make a change is Jesus Christ in our country. Amen. And the old-fashioned revival, the old-fashioned moving of the Holy Ghost uh, that is able to change lives. Uh, years ago when I was in the Bible college and I was uh, studying a class, it talked about how the, uh, whatever the, uh, the church has got liberal and how that they became away from God, uh, that the common person rose up and said, we're tired of the liturgy. We're tired of everything being told us about how to worship and what this means and what that means. And they started prayer meetings and they started preaching on the road. And through those prayer meetings and preaching on the road, revival started. And those revivals brought homes and families back together. Uh, those revivals uh, made dads throw down their liquor bar, a bottle and maybe go back home, get a job, start taking care of their families. It closed businesses. It closed saloons when revivals happened. It closed the prostitutes' houses. Uh, it, it closed all of those things. Why? Because real revival happened in America. It could still happen today. But my friend, it's going to take a mighty move of God in our country to see it reverse from the condition and the way that it's, work, uh, that it's going. Uh, and they say as it goes out west in California is the way that it eventually goes in the rest of the nation. Uh, because of the so many variations of the way that people worship and believe uh, that it's flowing this way. How were, were, did we conquer the wilderness? We started in the east and we went west, didn't we? Our history teaches that. But now we're starting in the west and moving toward the east with our immorality and all these things that are wrong. And so we get to the place where we're at today where the thing that the Bible says are wrong, our country says is right. And the thing that our country says is wrong, our God says is right. Amen? Uh, our country is rocking and reeling like a drunk man. It's unstable and it's about to fall and the only hope we've got is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the hope there is for the world. And when we think about prostitution is legal in our country. Uh, it is out west in a number of places in Mississippi and around there. Uh, these things are legal. They used to be illegal because they were immoral. But they're no longer immoral in the eyes of many people and the way that they live. God said in His Word, when you start to worship idols, you're going to suffer the vengeance of the curse that goes along with those idols. Let me throw you a little tidbit of information. As I study and I think about things and I read current events, I see what's going on. And all the nations that have trouble, we would consider them third world nations. They're very steeped in poverty. Uh, they are a lot of kids and uh, they don't have parents because the parents have died through the war and the involvement of all of these dictatorships and socialism kind of situation they're involved in. And they're just running wild. The countries are running wild. And because Christianity is not in those nations as a whole, and idolatry is, uh, regardless what the denomination hanger is on it, but because of what goes on in them that are not Christ-like, not biblical, amen, we see those countries struggling. They have a very poor infrastructure, roads and highways, very poor, dirt roads, no guardrails, no stop sign, no kind of laws according to the way that they travel at all. Uh, they're steeped in poverty, all sorts of disease and everything going on. Why is that? Because God's not recognized in the country. Where are we headed for in America? America is headed to be a third world country. Because we're disavowing God. We're telling God enough. We need to push Him out. Look back through our world history since the world began. It wasn't the outside country that came in to destroy them uh, that made them fall, but it was the corruption from within. The lack of morality, the lack of righteousness, even whether they were Christian nations or not. The more worse they got in immorality, the more they were vulnerable and ripe for God's judgment. Uh, that's every one that I can think of that's mentioned in the book of Daniel. It doesn't matter which one it is, whether the head, the ox, the, the eagle, whatever that it is. All of them came from within and destroyed themselves. America is ripe for destruction because we're corrupt 
from the inside. That's the situation that we're involved in today. Can you tell me what has happened to America? Let's look a couple of places with me, if you will. In the book of Psalms 106. Psalms 106, and verse 35. <coughs> but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. The people of Israel were mixed among the heathen and they learned the way that they worshipped. They learned the things that they did. And so they got tired of worshipping Jehovah God that had been there and present for them. And it's kind of like we are today. What happens whenever there's no wars or there's no hardship and everybody's doing pretty good? We start to rest on our laurel of what we've accomplished. And we no longer need God. And so that's what happened. They got into the promised land. God said, don't forget me. They said they wouldn't forget Him. They got into the promised land. They forgot God. And the thing that I want to mention here is that not only did they forget God, they brought all these other religions in and joined God to them. Now my Bible tells me that God's a jealous God. And He won't share His glory with nobody. Amen. He don't have to. He's the only real one. Amen. He's the only God that there is. And so look here a little bit further. Psalm 106. And they served their idols, which were a snare, a trap unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and daughters unto devils or to false gods. And I'm, I, I'm reminded when I first read and studied on the God Molech, and how they would raise up this uh, bronze-looking thing and the, this god Molek image that they made. And they would, America's doing the same thing, by the way. And they would raise this up, and it was hollow on the inside, and they'd place fire inside that, and they'd stoke it up real hot, and they had the arms of Molek like this, and those arms, when they got cherry red, they placed their sons and their daughters, their little babies, in the hands of that false god, and they would hear it scream and holler until it died, my friend. That's exactly what America has gone to today. We're sacrificing our children. The false gods. Shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own work, and went a whoring with their own inventions, false gods. And so they were defiled with their own work. Whenever we look around, we see murder, we see rape, we see robberies, we see killings, we see kids being on the old table, all of these things just for sport. Just for fun, that's just man worshiping himself. Saying, I don't need God. I'm God. I'll do what I want to do. Don't need no one else to tell me what to do. But God knows. Amen. Look with me quickly in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. For the time I've got left, I want to mention this. I'll go down this, this pathway. <laughs> God chooses life. And God knows you before you're born. God knows you when, whenever that there is a baby uh, come together in the womb. And how that God knows the workings that are mysterious to man. How that He puts together and makes a baby, whether it be a boy or a girl. God makes a human being. Amen. And He places His identity. Remember, we're made in the image and likeness of God. And He stamps His identity upon every boy and girl, uh, whether in the womb or outside. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God tells Jeremiah, I want to say it like this, God tells you and I, He said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before they came as forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet under the nations. Now the prophet part belongs to Jeremiah, but if God knew Jeremiah before he was born, God knows you and me too. Amen. Because we're not any different than Jeremiah. Uh, we're, we're here today, we're not there today, but God still knew us before we were born. We are a wonder and a maid, a miracle maid. Of God, go back to uh, uh, Psalms 139. <coughs> Psalms 
people are troubled about when do you call it a baby? When is it no longer fetus? Tell you, whenever that God brings those two entities together, they become a human being. Amen. It might be nine months, it might be eight, it might be nine and a half, it might be seven, it might be ten months before that baby's born. I'll tell you what, whenever it's born, it's been a baby for however long it's been in the womb. Amen. It's not a fetus, it's not a piece of matter, it's a living human being. One that God loves and that God says a blessing. Amen. It is a gift. And uh, Psalms 139 and verse 12. And you might ask why I start with verse 12. Let's read it. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Uh, to thee. So David is praying, search me, O God, and know my heart. Uh, he said, know my thoughts. Know if there be any wicked way in me. And then he said, the reason I ask that, Lord, is because no matter whether it's light or day, no matter whether I'm on top of a mountain or in a valley, if I'm at the bottom of the ocean or wherever I might be, you are there. Then he goes on and said, For thou hast possessed my reins, my inward part. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Before he was born, David said, The Lord, you knew me. That was common knowledge evidently back then. Amen. Maybe not such common knowledge today because it's inconvenient. And it's kind of a hard thing to say, I'm going to kill my baby by an abortion. But I'm going to kill my fetus. That may be a little bit easier to swallow. David said that God knew him before he was, before he was born. For thou hast possessed my reign, cover me in my mother's womb, I'll praise thee, for I am wonderfully and mar mar fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee, though it was hid from my mom, though it was hid from my dad, my brothers and sisters. You already saw me when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. I wasn't made complete. Amen. I'm still in that womb being formed. But you saw me there. And in thy book, God's remembrance, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as there was none of them. And so God said, I see your hands, even though your hands aren't perfect. I see your feet. I see your body. I see your head. I see your heart. Even though one else can see it. And even though it's unperfectly made right now and it's still growing, still getting to be what it should be, what it can be. God said, I see you there. Isaiah chapter 45. Here's another marvel. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, 2, and 3. Thus saith the Lord to His anointed, to the one that God's going to touch and do a special work in. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have holding, he's, he's given him strength. To subdue nations before him, before Cyrus. And I will loose the loins of kings. I'm going to take their strength away. To open for him, Cyrus, the two lay leap gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and will make the crooked places straight. Those things that's hard, I'm going to help you to get through them. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, cut in sunder the bars of iron, iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, the God of Israel. God said, Cyrus, all these things are yours. In fact, God called him Cyrus in this verse, in this chapter, 150 years before he was born. I found a new Cyrus in the womb. He knew him from eternity past. 150 years before he got his name. 150 years before his grandma and grandpa were born. 150 years before his parents were born. 150 years before he was born. God already knew him. He called him by name. That's how much God chooses life and how, how much it means uh, to the Lord. I'm getting ready to close. Psalms 127. I, I pray that you'll stay with me for just a couple of moments longer. 
Psalms 127, verse 3 and 5, 3, 4 and 5. And this is a song of the griefs of Solomon. Verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb, children, are His reward. As arrows, talking about children, in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Verse 5, Happy is the man that hath his quiver, or the place that you would put your arrow, which would be your weapons, which would be your strength, which would be your mind and your power, full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Your strength is in your family. <coughs> Stay together. <coughs> How many children <coughs> were doctors, presidents, lawyers, scientists, of whatever position that a baby 59 million possibility could they have been? Only God knows what the song says. Only God knows. They didn't have a chance to have a life, to be the president or to be a uh, corporation leader or I like this just to be a boy or girl, just to be part of a family. Now, I say that and I think about all the kids that's in the orphanages that don't have a mom and a daddy. Because something, not always mom and dad's fault. Uh, they both they they kill in some fashion, I don't know. They just put it in an orphanage. But for whatever reason, all the babies that's in an orphanage that don't have a mom and a daddy. Isn't it heartbreaking to think today that we've grown 59 million babies? Pretty much. To me, a, a, a baby means hope, means possibility. In fact, it could mean unlimited possibility. Now, the joys and the pleasure uh, that that baby could bring. I never thought whenever that me and Deb first uh, got pregnant, we were running children, uh, the joy that our children would bring to us. Unreal, the way that you begin to think. I don't know if, if God just the moment the baby's born slash just sending this out of it and strange up and what. But I, I could not imagine the difference that it made in my thinking when we first had written in a long time of two. And the same thing pretty much applies when the grandchildren come along. What a difference in thinking that it makes. They need a chance to have life. Have it like we do. One more last little thing on the code of invitation number. A number of years ago, uh, a medical doctor in uh, a medical school asked his class that question. And he said, The father uh, has syphilis and has had for some time syphilis is a second trend in disease, and without a lot of medicine, going to kill that syphilis killing. Uh, the mother of this family had TB, had tuberculosis. And so uh, they had children. And so the first child uh, that was born was born blind. Uh, that relation, the disease and things were so great uh, that it really took a toll on the baby in the womb. So the first one was born blind. Uh, they had another child, and that one died uh, shortly after uh, her. Uh, too many things that happened, it was wrong with it. Then they had a third child, and that child was born Deaf, couldn't hear, had no ability to hear. And then the fourth child that was born had tuberculosis, just like its mom did. Tuberculosis is a lung disease, and it gets hard to breathe the further along the boat tuberculosis gets, and it eventually suffocates you where you can't breathe. So all these things were pretty bad things that happened to this man and said, this, this woman had tuberculosis. She's, she's pregnant now, again, the professor tells the students. She's going to have another child. And they're going to come to you and ask for advice. They're willing to have an abortion. And so the students break up in the little discussion units. And they talk among themselves. And they come back and the professor says, all right, what have you decided? And I don't know how many little groups there were, but they said, we all have decided for abortion. That uh, this last child is not going to be good. And we decide for abortion. And the professor said, congratulations. You just killed the total. When you think about that, 
you just killed the Torah. Not giving him the chance to have life and to move along. Our country is in a great deal of trouble. Not just for one thing, not just for abortion. But it seems like that that snowball just gets bigger. The further down, the longer we go, it just gets bigger. Until it eventually it's going to hit the bottom and it's going to be over. Now, preaching to the choir this morning. But if there's any possibility that you don't think, well, maybe the abortion's not so bad, I hope that I can steer you a little bit toward the idea of the reparties. God is the one that gives life. He's the one that gives death. It's not up to us to choose and to play God. It's not up to these doctors. I think, I think that we slap God in the face after Roe versus Wade when we finally come to the conclusion that partial birth abortions shouldn't come to birth. When you can take a child that's practically completely formed, pull it halfway out of the birth tube, and then end its life. With it breathing, with its heart good, it being a perfect baby, nothing wrong with it, and still it's inconvenient to have that baby this time. In a human life, euthanasia. That's a funny term, isn't it? Euthanasia, definition, mercy killing. It's no longer drunkenness, it's a sickness. I think about all the opiate type deaths, epidemic that we're having in our country right now, and those things are preventable. Stop using the drugs. Stop using the drugs. And yet, they're trying to come up with some way to help by giving them less power drugs. Making it ability to have these things. Would you stand?